Good morning, everyone. Uh, we're here at the rectory and not at the church this morning. Um, here in New Brunswick, we have been placed in uh, what used to be called RED, uh, now phase three of provincial restrictions. And essentially, that means that we're in lockdown here in the province, uh, I believe, until January 30th, so a two-week period um, to allow the hospitals uh, and the healthcare system to recover their own, uh, to diminish the cases and the um, exponential increase that we have been seeing daily over the past few weeks. And so we here in the parish are uh, obeying those restrictions and because we are not able to meet, and because I believe that it is unfair to Sharon and to Mary, our organist, that we meet at the church, and also for cost-saving measures, I have decided to give them and myself a break, especially now that I finally have conquered this illness that has lasted since the 21st of December, and it's just really uh, the middle of this week that I've uh, really felt myself again. So, there are no real announcements. Uh, Vestry is not going to take place in January. We will leave that. There is nothing pressing. Our wardens, Vicky and Faye, will be able to um, field any questions uh, that you may have or any concerns. And if you do have any, I encourage you, um, well before the AGM, which will be taking place sometime around the middle of February, possibly even late February. I would like it to be in person, obviously distanced, but I believe that the reality will be that we may have to have it on Zoom one more time. It's not the best way of doing things, but we will see. We're certainly postponing it in order to allow ourselves the opportunity to maybe have that meeting in person. Um, but it's a good idea if you have any concerns as parishioners to field them to um, parishofkingston at gmail.com and uh, just address them as AGM concerns and the wardens can or myself can field with anything that you may um, deem important in the parish and, co and a concern of your own. And we can deal with that at the annual general meeting and deal with it in the coming future. Other than that, as I've said, nothing is happening. Our hall will not be used other than for the daycare. And uh, I have asked Sharon to limit her time in uh, the hall um, just in order to protect herself and to protect others. So, today we celebrate morning prayer on this second Sunday after the Epiphany. Um, like I did last week, I will have uh, the service book up and the readings up, and we will do our best to worship together. This has been previously recorded. It is Sunday morning. It is just after 8, and um, this is live. Um, there is no editing. Um, I'm just going to... I have started, and so we just go. So um, it's very live, and, uh, and so know that at 10 o'clock when you join us for worship that I will be with you in spirit as I am indeed now. So, as we say in church which is the picture before us, let us prepare ourselves for worship. Lord, open our lips, and our mouth shall proclaim your praise. O God, make speed to save us. O Lord, make haste to help us. Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. Alleluia. 
God rules over all the earth. O come, let us worship. We will say the Venite together. Come, let us sing to the Lord. Let us shout for joy to the rock of our salvation. Let us come before his presence with thanksgiving and raise a loud shout to him with psalms. For the Lord is a great God and a great king above all gods. In his hand are the caverns of the earth and the heights of the hills are his also. The sea is his for he made it and his hands have molded the dry land. Come, let us bow down and bend the knee and kneel before the Lord our Maker, for he is our God, and we are the people of his pasture and the sheep of his hand. Oh, that today you would hearken to his voice. Today our first reading will be taken from the book of Paul, the first letter of Paul to the Corinthians. Chapter 12, beginning at the first verse. Now concerning spiritual gifts, brothers and sisters, I do not want you to be uninformed. You know that when you were pagans, you were enticed and led astray to idols that could not speak. Therefore, I want you to understand that no one speaking by the Spirit of God ever says, let Jesus be cursed. And no one can say, Jesus is Lord, except by the Holy Spirit. Now there are varieties of gifts, but the same Spirit and there are varieties of services, but the same Lord. And there are a variety of activities, but it is the same God who activates all of them in everyone. To each is given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. To one is given through the Spirit the utterance of wisdom, and to another the utterance of knowledge, according to the same Spirit, to another faith by the same Spirit, to another gifts of healing by the one Spirit, to another the working of miracles, to another prophecy, to another the discernment of spirits, to another various kinds of tongues, to another the interpretation of tongues. All these are activities by one and the same Spirit, who allots to each one the individually, individually, just as the Spirit chooses. The Word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Our appointed psalm is Psalm 36, verses 5 to 10, and let us say them responsively by the full verse. Your love, O Lord, reaches to the heavens, and your faithfulness to the clouds. Your righteousness is like the strong mountains, your justice like the great deep. You save both man and beast, O Lord. How priceless is your love, O God! Your people take refuge under the shadow of your wings. They feast upon the abundance of your house. You give them drink from the river of your delights. For with you is the well of life, and in your light we see light. Continue your loving kindness to those who know you and your favor to those who are true of heart. 
Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. Alleluia. Our Gospel reading today is written in the Gospel according to St. John, chapter 2, beginning at the first verse. On the third day there was a wedding in Cana of Galilee, and the mother of Jesus was there. Jesus and his disciples had also been invited to the wedding. When the wine gave out, the mother of Jesus said to him, They have no wine. And Jesus said to her, Woman, what concern is that to you and me? My hour has not yet come. His mother said to the servants, Do whatever he tells you. Now standing there were six stone water jugs for the Jewish rites of purification, each holding twenty or thirty gallons. Jesus said to them, Fill the jars with water. And they filled them to the brim, He said to them, Now draw some out, and take it to the chief steward. So they took it. When the steward tasted the water that had become wine, and did not know where it came from, though the servants who had drawn the water knew, the steward called the bridegroom and said to him, Everyone serves the good wine first then the inferior wine after the guests have become drunk. But you have kept the good wine until now. Jesus did this, the first of his signs, in Cana of Galilee, and revealed his glory, and his disciples believed in him. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. It is customary after the gospel reading in the morning prayer service to say the Benedictus. And so let us now say the Benedictus together. Blessed be the Lord, the God of Israel. He has come to his people and set them free. He has raised up for us a mighty Savior, born of the house of his servant David. Through his holy prophets he promised of old that he would save us from our enemies, from the hands of all that hate us. He promised to show mercy to our fathers and to remember his holy covenant. This was the oath he swore to our father Abraham, to set us free from the hands of our enemies, free to worship him without fear, holy and righteous in his sight all the days of our life. You, my child, shall be called the prophet of the Most High, for you will go before the Lord to prepare his ways, to give his people knowledge of salvation by the forgiveness of their sins. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever, world without end. Amen. Let us pray.
May the words of my lips and the meditations of all of our hearts be now and always acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. I've been thinking about this sermon for quite some time and thinking about the importance of both readings that we have before us today. I look first to the reading from Paul to the Corinthians, and Paul is speaking to a community that is f fractious. He says in the early chapters, you know, is there Cephas's church? Is there Chloe's church? Is there uh, Paul's church? Is there Apollos's church? This is Christ's church. And we understand that the people of Corinth were choosing particular sides, particular ways. They were identifying themselves with the leaders of the church and with the group of people that obviously they must have been comfortable with. They were with them because, as I said, this brought them some level of comfort. They were their friends. Apollos' group would have found his words particularly compelling. And Chloe's church, part of that Corinth, a community of Christians, a small community, would have turned to Chloe, her friends, maybe her family, her servants. And they would have turned to her and listened to her voice over the voice of Apollos or Peter, Cephas, or Paul. These factions were driving Paul crazy because for him, this is all about Christ. This is Christ's church. This is not Peter Gilly's church or Douglas Painter's church or Bonnie LeBlanc's church, or the Church of the Scovilles, who date back, if you didn't know, to 1788 or 1785, when he came up from Connecticut to be a part of this community, or was looking to be part of this community. We here are part of a larger communion, a communion in Christ Jesus. Yes, we're Anglicans, but we're part of a wider community that sees Baptists and Pentecostals, those who have different ways and means, and one of the joys of the Anglican communion is that we embrace the breadth of Anglicanism. And what that means is the breadth of the spiritual gifts that have been given to us, as articulated here in chapter 12. Paul is starting to sum up his message to these factions within Corinth. His next chapter, he speaks of love. If I am a resounding gong or a clang, if I have all these tongues and have all these gifts, but I don't have love, I'm, I'm just noise. Symbols and banging and noise. It must be built on the foundation of love. 
Now recently, literally today, and I always leave about five minutes of my sermon to the Holy Spirit, and as some of you know, that five minutes can go on for about 10 to 15, but I received a letter um, from a friend uh, through the parish this morning, a friend that I have had for almost 40 years and haven't really spoken to at all for probably a decade, to be honest. She's a Palestinian Christian who I met at um, CJEP, which uh, would be grade 12 and 13 here in New Brunswick. We went to a private school together and we became good friends. Amalia wrote in a Christmas letter to her friends and family that a couple of weeks ago while out for a walk, I spied a message emblazoned on the sidewalk near a stop sign. In what looked like blue chalk, someone had written, Empathy is humanity's hope. Empathy is humanity's hope. Empathy is an expression of love that has us put ourselves in other people's shoes to appreciate what it's like to be Apollos' followers, his disciples, to put ourselves in the shoes of Chloe's people, of those who appreciate the different churches around us. Because ultimately, our hope is to come together. That is the love that we are seeking. Within Anglicanism, we seek to bring in the Pentecostal gifts, the gifts of those who are evangelical, those who are conservative, those who are liberal, those who want modernity to come into our liturgies, and those who also want liturgies to remain consistent from the 15th century and even back to original sources, to the foundation of the church, our calling as Anglicans is not to put the moniker that we are Anglicans as much as we see ourselves as Christians who promote the empathy of love, respect, and compassion. And that that goes beyond having a broad church or having a high church, or having a low church, or a BCP church, or a BAS church. Our foundational model is not um, Henry VIII chopping off the heads of his various wives because he wanted divorce, and neither is it Cromwell, before the famous Cromwell, who in the 1530s was urging a reclaiming of property from the Roman Catholic Church so that they could acquire more land to be able to have more taxes and more property. It was a big money grab. And it was looking at the king as being the head of the church and not the pope. But those are all distractions. Elizabeth, the famous Queen Elizabeth, I think Queen Elizabeth too has probably outfamed her now, but Elizabeth brought about a settlement as in the 50s, the 1550s, everyone was, was getting their heads chopped off because they were part of factions. This group was Catholic and this group was Protestant and as the politics and the royalty changed. So did the focus on more of a Catholic understanding or more of a Protestant understanding. And those who were found 
on the opposite sides were being punished, put to death. And Elizabeth said in 1558, enough is enough. I'm going to bring about a settlement. I want us all to get along. I want us to have something foundational that helps us understand that our spiritual gifts and our way of worshiping and the way the Lord has called us is bringing us together. It should not be pushing us apart. Growing up in Montreal, I remember churches that were particularly black as defined by themselves. Jamaican, Bajan, Caribbean. Churches that were high churches. Churches that were Chinese or Oriental churches or Filipino churches. And the list can go on and on because they wanted to gather in communities that were familiar, that were comfortable culturally. But Jesus is saying to us, we must go on beyond those friendships, those comfort levels. Empathy is about going beyond the comfort of what we already know, that ends up being sympathy, to be honest, to an empathic understanding where we're intentionally looking at what it must be like to be other. To love neighbor and to love God is to take ourselves out of our comfort zones and put us into a new, fresh understanding that we are all to come together in one great church. I call it a communion. Today, I desperately miss having communion. When I was home alone on Christmas Eve, the first time I've ever been away from church on Christmas Eve, that there was something missing in my life. Today, you not being in church, there's something missing. My fears, my anxieties, my worries come from a church that is moving further apart in our Chloe way and Apollos way and Cephas way and increasing our Pharisaic, Sadducaic and scribal ways where we become keepers of laws and methodologies and not understanding the empathy of Christ in his love as articulated in John's gospel later on. When we talk about these spiritual gifts in Paul, as he says, the utterance of wisdom, the spirit of common good, the manifestation of faith and healing and miracles and prophecies and speaking in tongues and discernment of gifts, these are not to be separated into separate churches because we don't feel that these are appropriate to us. We are to embrace them all. That is what the vision of Elizabeth was. And yes, she was a queen. But we see many over the years within the Anglican tradition try to emphasize that. In 1886 in Chicago and later in 1888 in Lambeth, a quadrilateral was struck, and this Chicago Lambeth quadrilateral was to dismiss the very particular time of the 39 articles, which was very um, 
much placed in the 1550s. To have four main understandings of why, what is our foundational understanding as people of God. Forget the Anglicanism of what are our fundamental understandings. The first was scripture is sufficient for salvation. Scripture is primary. It gives us the words of God and helps us to discern. And I'm not saying that everything is without error or without human hand, but it's sufficient for salvation. And we see things differently as people of God, but that should not dismiss my ministry or your ministry as seeing Scripture as being inerrant. It is sufficient for salvation. And then the creeds, statements that have been made, yes, in periods of time when there was political pressures and there are people who don't appreciate the creed, the Nicene Creed, because of the political aspect that was going on in the early 4th century. But these creeds set out who God is, who Christ is, that he is the only begotten Son, eternally begotten, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, homoousius, with God, of God, not separate, not apart, not chosen or appointed, but very God of very God. Our creeds are important because they set out the bare minimum of what it is that we are to believe, that it's contextual, placing Pilate in that period of time. And then the sacraments. In the Anglican Church, we have two main sacraments, baptism and communion. Those ordained by Christ, and specifically ordained by Christ, for us to practice. Do these in remembrance of me. Bring the Spirit in so that you can have that empathy, and so that you can see beyond these fractious little groups. The Eucharist is to call us together, to bring us together. Our Eucharist is the only time that we can drop our politics, our church politics, our church theological um, understandings, and come together in a shared Eucharistic meal that draws us into Christ Jesus in a mystery. Whether you receive it by faith or whether you receive it as the body of Christ, you are open to God's influence in your life and the ultimate calling of God's empathy within your life. That is the third aspect of that quadrilateral. The fourth is the episcopacy and the importance of leadership and of calling of recognizing that some are called to be open and empathetic to all, drawing all people in and not separating others. And I have been as guilty of doing some of that as you know. As a liberal Christian, I have a tendency of dismissing other understandings. And I must be better at my empathy, and my love of other. I want us to turn now to the gospel reading. And the gospel reading is clear. Usually we read it at weddings. They have no wine, Mary says. 
What do I care? Says Jesus. This isn't my concern. It's not your concern. We're just simply guests. Jesus was not invited because he was Jesus. He was invited. It specifies Mary was there. And then Jesus and his disciples. Mary comes first. And so we have this understanding that there's a wedding going on and we think to ourselves, okay, well, you know, normally I preach about the abundance of God's love. And I don't think that that should be dismissed at all. The amount of wine created is abundant. And of course, we can very easily make uh, draw this into a Eucharistic understanding where that wine is abundant for all people. And I stand by that um, aspect of this reading, but I thought something different this time. Remember, the Sadducees and Pharisees did not get along. They had a very different understanding, and they had a very fractious relationship. The reasons that they're together... Um, to fight against Jesus is actually notable. We should be very conscientious of the fact that when Sadducees and Pharisees are together, it's kind of like getting um, very, very conservative um, people together with ultra, ultra liberals together, and they both have a common cause to fight against. That would be the equivalent of today. Here, Jesus speaks of something I think is different. The, the steward says to the bridegroom, everyone serves the good wine first, and then the inferior wine after the guests have become drunk. But you have kept the good wine until now. There wouldn't have been a Eucharistic understanding to the initial hearers of this in Cana. They would have had no Eucharistic understanding. In John's Gospel, when it was written, the Eucharist would have been established, and they would have drawn that illusion. But I think that, for me, what I was looking at was the good wine is the wine of Christ, of that best stuff is coming now. The old wine, the Pharisaic understanding, the Sadducaic understanding, and then the scribes in the background, the rule mongers. Everyone has turned to their own way. We have all gone away like sheep, wandering. The old wine is the old way. And now we have the good wine arrive in abundance so that we can all come together and all appreciate the best things for all people. All people. And Paul makes a point of ministering to people who were dismissed as being nothing more than alien. The Gentiles. And his role was to embrace all people. Just like Peter, seeing that vision of the, as I always see in my mind, the gingham tablecloth coming down from heaven with all this food that was wrong for Jews to eat because of the restrictions placed by scribes and Pharisees and Sadducees. You cannot eat this. It is wrong. Peter says, but Lord, I've never done, I've never touched anything wrong. And the Lord says, it is okay, because it's about love and empathy, compassion 
and mercy. It's about bringing us all together under Christ. And our leadership is called upon to give that to the people of God. Our leadership is to be empathetic toward all people, but also recognize that there needs to be a promotion and understanding of all within the Church of Christ. And in my case, within the Anglican umbrella, where we all share these four values. Scripture, statements of faith, the Eucharist, and baptism, and leadership. Leadership ordained by God to lead, to set boundaries, to Enable us to understand that we are together, that being apart is not acceptable. To be Chloe's people, to be Cephas's people, to be Paul's people, to be Apollos's people is a wrong way of us to see church. Church is about all of us together in Christ. And so when we choose particular ways, of expressing our theological preference, we need to employ empathy towards those who are different from us. That that is the true calling of God in grace. And that is what is being articulated here. The new wine, the abundant new wine. The old ways are old. They do not come now. Now there is a new beginning. We have a freshness, a giddiness that comes with drinking wine, a joy, an openness. Think of the Eucharist or think of your own types of Eucharist where you have family meals and you're together and don't tell me that your family are all the same. I know that all of us have factions within our family. But when we gather at Christmas and celebrations, and we're all so very different, but we share a meal together because we are family. And I pray that oftentimes that is a good experience. And when someone dies or is missing from the table. We do miss them, even when we haven't appreciated them. I miss my brothers and sisters from different parts of Christianity who have different theological understandings and who are more conservative or more liberal even than I because we are to be under the same truth as we've just heard, the truth sent from above, the God of love. Let us employ that love in our empathy towards our church and towards those who have no understanding of church. What Amalia wrote is right. Empathy is humanity's hope. And it was ordained in God through Christ Jesus. And now to God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit, bless us and keep us this blessed day and forevermore. Amen. Let us say together the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. 
he suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again, he ascended into heaven, and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. I'm going to flip at the moment, and I'm just going to bookmark this page. And I'm just going to flip back because I want to bring us to a part of the service that I wanted to start with, but forgot. The sacrifice of God is a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart, O God, you will not despise. Dear friends in Christ, as we prepare to worship Almighty God and to pray, let us with penitent and obedient hearts confess our sins that we may obtain forgiveness by his infinite goodness and mercy. Let us confess our sins against God and our neighbor. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry and we humbly repent. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your name. Amen. Almighty God, have mercy upon you. Pardon and deliver you from all of your sins. Confirm and strengthen you in all goodness and keep you in eternal life. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. This is the first and the great commandment. The second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. There is no commandment greater than these. At this time we turn to prayer. We'll pray number three. Hmm. Mm. Let us offer our prayers to the source of all love and all life, saying, Lord, hear our prayer. Merciful Lord, we pray for all who call themselves Christians, that we may become a royal priesthood and a holy nation to the praise of Jesus Christ, our Savior. Lord, hear our prayer. We pray for Linda, our primate, for David, our Archbishop 
and bishop. And for all bishops, especially remembering Bishop Matthias in Ghana, in the Diocese of Ho, and other ministers. For myself, as priest and rector, for Sharon, as our deacon, for John, as our honorary assistant. We pray for our lay readers, for Donna and Barb, for Kathy and Connor, Patsy and Ellen. And we pray for Connor, who is pursuing within the diocese a call as an aspirant. We pray for our deanery and for all ministers that they may remain faithful to their calling and rightly proclaim the word of truth. Lord, hear our prayer. We pray for Elizabeth, our queen, for the leaders of the nations, especially for Justin, our prime minister, and for Blaine, our premier, for their caucuses, and also for those in opposition, for their leaders and their representatives, and for all people within our country who take on leadership positions. that your people may lead quiet and peaceable lives. Lord, hear our prayer. We pray for this community, for the St. John region, and for the Kennebecasis Valley, and for those who live here, on the peninsula, we pray for the poor and the rich, the elderly and the young, men and women, that you will show your good will to all. Lord, Hear our prayer. We pray for the victims of our society, particularly remembering the Jewish community today that once again has seen anti-Semitism We pray, Lord Christ, that healing may take place within the Jewish community and within the hearts of those who are anti-Semitic, that you will bring an understanding of empathy and love in the midst of fear, anger, and ignorance. Remove violence, Lord, from our society Help us to see the gifts that people who differ from us can bring to our lives. And we pray for those who minister to them. We pray in our parish for Craig, for Gary, 
for Alida. And we pray for all those who need our prayers at this time, who we know and those whom we have heard of. Let us lift those names up to God our Savior and Lord. that you will be their help, comfort, and defense. Lord, hear our prayer. We pray for those preparing for baptism who are able to receive that sacrament in these troubled COVID times. And we pray for those recently baptized within the whole church, that they may be strengthened in faith. Lord, hear our prayer. We give thanks for all the saints who have found favor in your sight, from earliest times, prophets, apostles, martyrs, and those whose names are known to you alone. And we pray that we too may be counted among your faithful witnesses. Lord, hear our prayer. We pray our collect prayer today. Almighty God, your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ, is the light of the world. May your people, illumined by your word and sacrament, shine with the radiance of your glory, that he may be known, worshipped, and obeyed to the ends of the earth who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. We will use the traditional words for the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. Let us bless the Lord. Thanks be to God. May the God of hope Fill us with all joy and peace in believing through the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. And the blessing of God Almighty, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, be amongst you and remain with you and those whom you love this blessed day and forevermore. Amen.